Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with KLCS in Los Angeles. Today we are chatting with Jennifer Gregg, Executive Director of the One Archives Foundation. Jennifer has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Jennifer, for joining us today. Thank you, thank you for having me. The One Archives Foundation is tasked with preserving a part of our history, a part of American history, a part of world history. What part of history are you, ta are you tasked with preserving? We preserve and make visible the history of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community, and not just here in the United States, but across the world. And you are the largest continually operating, and this was something that I did yeah. not know. You are the largest continually operating uh, or LGBTQ organization in the world. That's right, we were founded in 1952, right here in Los Angeles, by three individuals who wanted to start a magazine, The One Magazine, which was the wide, most widely distributed LGBTQ magazine in the country. It ran until 1967. And something that's really interesting about the magazine is that in 1954, the Los Angeles Postmaster removed the magazine, not just from the mail, but from newsstands as well, under decency laws of the time. And our founders, as brave as they were, they fought back, and we went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1958, we prevailed. So we were the first case around freedom of speech for the LGBTQ community because of that magazine, the one magazine. Visibility is so important. If you are made to be invisible, if you are not allowed to speak, then your fundamental right is removed and you become, by definition, a non-person, a non-citizen with no rights. So just this idea of speaking out is so important to our civil society. It's, it's ensconced in, the, in, our, in our Constitution, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's ensconced in our Declaration of Independence, in our earliest documents, this right to speak and the right to be heard. That's right, and, and the right for equality. And when our founders started one, it didn't start as an archive, it started as a publication. And what they realized over time is in order to make us visible, we can't be erased from that history. And so they started this archive, which now has three million pieces of queer history uh, that have been preserved for more than 65 years. And that history has not been collected uh, in uh, places like the Smithsonian, which is a, a grand repository of American history. There is so much history of our nation that um, has been skipped over by the main uh, cultural institutions that we have. So talk about items of your collection and, and how that collection is structured and organized. So the collection um, started uh, really by Jim Kepner, one of our founders. Uh, he realized in the 40s when he came out, uh, when he identified as a gay man, that there wasn't really anything about our community. So he started collecting. He started collecting books and he started collecting stories and histories from his friends. And then when the One Archives was founded, after the magazine began, he and volunteers and our other founders literally started diving into dumpsters to collect our history. And so our, our collection uh, goes back uh, before the 1940s. It actually goes back in, in the turn of the century. And those three million items contain diaries, uh, ephemera, buttons, t-shirts, organizational records. We have the records of the LGBT uh, Center here in Los Angeles, Project Angel Food, which is another very prominent organization that was founded here in LA. We have um, we have art, we have beautiful art by queer artists and about the queer community. And we have hundreds of thousands of records on activities, acts of resistance, movement moments of the LGBT community. It also is a living archive that shows that where there are people, there are gay people. And, and this is not a, a, an issue um, uh, in, uh, which has often been characterized throughout history as uh, being either for or against any religion, either, um, either uh, some nefarious plan with some um, uh, nefarious intent uh, with, with uh, any type of direction. It's just, it's just being a person. If you're, if you're a person um, uh, and, and you have enough people collected, there are uh, people with different ideas, different 
inclinations, different orientations, different genders, different sexualities. It's just who we are. That's right. That's right. And what's really exciting about the work of the One Archives Foundation is that we're able to take those histories and we educate the public. So we do that through several programs, through our exhibition work. We have a gallery in West Hollywood that's provided to us by the city where we mount exhibitions. We have um, an amazing education program. We have a Youth Ambassadors for Queer History program where high school students come into the archives and they research um, the history of of their community. You know, we're a community um, that doesn't really have that family photo album that's passed down. We have to create that through our history and across generations of the LGBT community. So the fact that these youth are coming in and they're discovering their history, they're discovering uh, the people that paved the way for their rights and their equality today is really amazing. And then we also train teachers um, around the Fair Education Act, which is legislation that was passed here in California in 2011. It became law in 2012. And the Fair Education Act uh, stands for fair, accurate, um, and uh, res inclusive and respectful um, education. And it mandates that uh, public schools K through 12 uh, teach accurate and authentic LGBTQ history and the history of people with disabilities. And so we bring teachers into the archives and they create lesson plans that are then available for free. And another exciting program that we just launched two years ago is our fellowship program. So we provide stipends for LGBTQ researchers to come into the archives. And um, one of the fellows researched the history of conversion therapy and how that was so detrimental and still today is so detrimental for the LGBTQ community. Talk about the changes that have occurred since the uh, founding in 1952 of, of one uh, as a publication and then eventually as, as an archive and, and how the archive has evolved to accommodate this growing movement in which um, there is so much more integration, not complete yet, but integration of, of just people into society without um, uh, uh, reference uh, to separateness, but basically uh, society coming together and, and trying to tear down the walls that we've erected over, over uh, decades and even, even the last century. Mm -hmm. Well, when the archives uh, first started, um, our founders and our volunteers could have been arrested for identifying as LGBTQ. They could have been uh, sent to a mental institution uh, during that time. So the there 50s. was the, the arrest would have been because of immorality, Correct. right? Indecency laws. Indecency and so on and so forth. The mental institution um, idea was that there was something uh, medically wrong with or, and psychologically wrong with somebody. Correct. Um, and so just the sheer fact that our founders started collecting and had this widely distributed magazine um, really um, allowed our community to start organizing and to start coming together and to start fighting for their rights and for their equality. And, and, and the pernicious piece of this is that even uh, filing a brief with the Supreme Court, um, people forget a win was it advanced civil rights. Correct. But a loss could have resulted in incarceration. That's right. Uh, because a, a loss with a, with a subsequent removal of rights. So the actual willingness to stand up and fight mm -hmm. is a declaration of, of, of not only right, but also of the willingness to take a risk. To, right. to engage in a battle where there are persona personal freedoms at stake. Right, right. And in uh, 1959, so just a few years after the organization was founded, which again was founded in 1952, uh, there was an act of resistance here in Los Angeles, Cooper's Donuts. So in May of 1959, uh, a donut shop here in uh, downtown Los Angeles near Pershing Square, uh, where many members of the LGBT community had gathered, there was a police raid. And police raids were quite common during that time. And uh, the patrons, uh, the members of our community, uh, fought back against the police. So they threw donuts and straws and napkin holders and cups and anything they could get their hands on. And the police retreated. 
and that group of individuals started an organization called PRIDE, which stands for Personal Rights in Defense and Education. And they started uh, a newsletter, which eventually became The Advocate, which is a very prominent uh, worldwide distributed LGBTQ publication that just celebrated its 50th anniversary. And some from Cooper's Donuts, uh, Pride continued and organized against the police raids of the Black Cat, also here in Los Angeles. Yes. So these acts of resistance were taking place uh, even before Stonewall, which so many of us are familiar with. And again, the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, uh, we just celebrate it. And so we saw uh, just by having this organization and having our history in a space that people could access and to know that they were a part of a community, we were creating safety. And I think that's what's really important about the archives and about our history. It gives people um, a sense of place and a sense of belonging and um, a sense that they continue the fight for equality. So you have these collections, but what do you do with the collections? How do you ensure that the public is exposed to these collections in a systematic way and that education is not only to the already educated or the already exposed, but, but that people are continually exposed um, who are not necessarily aware of this history? We do that through the programs. Uh, that we have at the foundation. So our education programs, our youth ambassadors for queer history, that's how we ensure that high school students are receiving information about LGBTQ history and they work within their GSAs, which in the Gender and Sexuality Alliance clubs in their high schools. So we're disseminating information and it's so important. We know that LGBTQ youth are among the highest at-risk youth population in this country. So having the opportunity to learn about themselves, learn about their history, see themselves um, as leaders in the community is really inspiring. It provides an opportunity for mentorship for those youth. Um, and it provides us an opportunity to do amazing outreach. In terms of, of uh, how you secure the, the sort of the, this physical stuff, is it, is it just kept in warehouses around Los Angeles? So in 2010, the foundation, uh, the original entity, gifted the collection to the University of Southern California Libraries. And the archives are now housed right off campus in an old fraternity house. It was actually uh, the Delta House. And uh, <laughs> it's a great, beautiful architectural space uh, in, from 1960. And their uh, new uh, newsletter was actually the Rainbow Times, so it was it was meant to be there. And the University of Southern California maintains the space and supports the archival staff. Jennifer Gregg, thank you so much for sharing with us the work of the One Archives Foundation, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.